um, thanks for having me sort of thing. <laughs> so my first question isn't actually going to be my question because I was speaking to a guy uh, this past weekend and he was asking what my week looks like. And I said, I was going to interview you and you're cycling around the world solo and unsupported. And he just laughed. And then he was like, why? <laughs> so I'm going to take his question and ask it to you and just say, why, bro? Why? It, it was just a thought that I couldn't get out of my head, really. Um, that, 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 that's the reason why. I kind of th thought of it. Somebody said, like, some people said some things that, you know, we're, we're on completely different topics, but kind of, you know, kept, kept sticking in my head. And so I just, I just decided to go for it. That's why, because, because I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather do it than rather not do it. Yeah, I kind of ju jumped into it pretty quickly because if, if I thought of why am I doing this too much, then, then I probably wouldn't have done it. And then one day I would have regretted not doing that. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's kind of the reason, reason why I kind of jumped into it straight away. Uh, it was, it was actually something Josh Ibbett said when we were at the race around Rwanda in not even sure what year now, because my, my concept of time has changed so much, but we, we were talking about this other race and I, I said, I, I won't be able to get leave from work. And he said, uh, he said, you can, you can always take leave from work, you know? And, and he was basically saying like, you know, follow, follow your heart, do what you want to do. Don't feel like you have to stick into what everyone's expecting you to do and what, you know, you've grown up thinking you should do just, follow your dreams when when you're young and and you can and yeah ever since he said that it, it kind of stuck in my head and i thought well i won't just leave you know to go and do this race so if i if i leave i'm going to do something that's really worthwhile uh, and it has been worthwhile it's been a crazy really crazy uh 13 months 13 months tomorrow actually just talk us through your journey so far. So you left Hernhill Velodrome 13 months ago. So just talk us through the route because you mentioned you're in Asia now in which you didn't really intend to be in initially and you spent six weeks here and you know, just just the A to Z so far of your journey. Yeah, I mean, I, I started off really hot. You know, I, I initially planned, uh, I thought it could be eight months and that was off like calculations of... Uh, if I ride 160 kilometers every single day for seven months, then that also gives me 31 days of not riding at all. So for like, you know, so, some flights I was going to have to do, there was going to be some days where I'd want to rest. I thought I'll only need 30 of those, you know, it'll be no problem. So I, I started really, really quick to kind of uh, achieve that, that goal that I had. So that, that meant I went through Europe uh, pretty fast, you know, through France, Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, back into France, into Germany, Austria, Slovenia, and then into the Balkans un until I reached, you know, crossing Montenegro, Mas North Macedonia, uh, Bosnia as well, which is a wild, wild country, um, until I reached the center of Turkey. And it, it was in Turkey that uh, my friend Finley joined me, and that's where we filmed uh, the first mind mapping film. And we left each other there at the center. I'd initially planned to go to Iran. But even though I got my visa, there, there were some protests there. Well, not some protests, there, there were very big protests there at the time. So a lot of people said, not the best time to go to Iran. So from the center of Turkey, I flew to Mumbai in India. Uh, that was after about one and a half months. So then after two and a half months, I'd crossed the entirety of India from Mumbai to uh, a, a small city in the, in the northeast called uh, Guwahati in the, in the state of Sikkim beautiful part of the world. They got a really cool mountain bike scene there, but I wasn't there long enough to really kind of jump into it. So one day that's, that's the place to return to, uh, from Guwahati, you know, Myanmar also off the cards at the moment. So I flew over Myanmar to Hanoi. So I arrived in Hanoi only three, about three and a half months after leaving. And I'm, Really, as the crow flies, I'm still not that far from Hanoi. So the, the kind of the way I was choosing to ride and, and take everything kind of hugely, hugely changed. Uh, from Hanoi, I actually, I actually went up to the Chinese border. You know, China was also off the cards at the time because of the COVID rules. But China is another world. It really fascinates me. And so I thought, I just, I just want to see it. So I cycled up to the Chinese border and then from there turned south uh, all the way through Vietnam into Cambodia, 
Uh, actually, I did dip into Laos a little bit uh, for visa purposes, into Cambodia, through Thailand, into Malaysia, uh, and Singapore, and now Indonesia. Um, that, uh, that, that's taken a long time to get there. I, you know, initially, I planned to spend a week in Malaysia, and I ended up staying there for about four and a half months. I never planned to come to Indonesia, and I've been here for about a month and a half. I, I never planned to go to the Philippines or Taiwan, and I'll be going there next. So the, the journey is really kind of growing into something else. So even though it's been 13 months, I really don't have an idea of when I'm going to be back, which is something my friends ask me, my family ask me. But as, as much as I miss them, it would, it, I, I left home with this goal in mind to ride around the world. So I feel I can't, I can't return home um, until I finished that, because it would kind of feel like a bit of a loss to me. So that's where I am now, 13 months uh, in Bali, about to go back to Jakarta, and then, so yeah, soon to the Philippines. You've ridden through like a lot of developed countries, and I imagine it's like a mother's nightmare with your son gallivanting through some obscure countries by himself. What sort of surprised you about these countries? Because your social media feed is full of like really positive like really wholesome interactions with people. I mean, yeah, it's, you, you, you say it's a mother's nightmare, but you know, my, my parents, they've been really supportive of, of everything. You know, even when the, the journey was going to continue longer than expected, they said, yeah, you know, that's, that's fine. You know, you, you do that. It's not like they message me every single day, worrying about me, concerned about where I am. They, my, my parents know me better than probably how I would like like to admit that they know me so they just let me kind of you know do my thing um you know what's what surprised me the most uh it was it was actually first in it was when i was in india the, the panniers on the on the on the bike uh, the tail fin kind of had a little problem and i needed to get some welding done you know really it was kind of like gut-wrenching that it happened because had i not been able to continue like i wouldn't have been able to see any of india and like i only had a one-month visa but then like they have this saying in India that, yeah, like in India, anything can happen. And from like the worst thing, it became the best thing because probably about like 15 different people helped me fix the problem that day. And by the end of the day, everything was fixed. I was in a nice warm bed. I had loads of amazing food. And it, it just it just struck me that uh, when, when, when we think of the words uh, rich, you often think of it, you know, in terms of uh, like, uh, monetary success you know how rich is is how wealthy you are but but really there it's like how fulfilling a life you can lead um and like what you can do to kind of put back into the into the world around you and, and that and that kind of continued then then throughout asia you know it's the random just acts of kindness that that people do to support the journey that i i didn't i didn't really experience that uh in in europe um Turkey, Turkey was actually the first place that that started to happen. Um, so that, that's what's been most surprising is that, you know, you, you might, if you haven't gone there, you probably hear, uh, you know, horror stories of, my, of, of what might have happened and, and areas that you don't go to. But really, like, 99% of people in this world uh, are, are just, like, just like us. You know, we're all the same. We're all human. And it, it's just kind of taught me that that you can find common ground with anyone you can get along with anyone we all want the same things uh we all have the same dreams and desires and and that doesn't matter what your what your background is where you come from what your what your situation is um so yeah that that that's really what surprised me the most about that is just being able to find common ground and get along with with anyone it's interesting what you said there about in india how richness isn't what you have in the bank account, but living a fulfilling life. There was a really interesting study done like, off the back of that. And they had uh, two groups of people. They had Americans and they had Japanese. And they were both given 30 days to make themselves as happy as possible. So the Americans went off, did what they think they would make them happy, and so did the Japanese. And then they recorded the results after 30 days. And the Japanese were a lot more happier, and the Americans weren't as happy. And what the Americans did, they went out and did loads of stuff for themselves. They bought loads of stuff for themselves. They did loads of like self-retreat spa days. Whereas the Japanese went and volunteered for different things in the community. They went to help family members. And the, the Japanese culture is about happiness, is helping others. 
and America is about helping yourself. So I just think, especially as you sort of got further <laughs> east, you sort of really discovered that, and uh, and I think that's fascinating. Yeah, although on the on on the flip side of that, you know, if you know, like I like I said a minute ago, like ninety nine percent of people are good people, you know, and they're and they're just you know they're just like us. If, if you're to really extrapolate that, you know, it, it it is the same in in countries in the West as well. But the 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 difference that I have uh, here is that you st you stand out a lot when you're riding on a specialized diverge in the middle of nowhere with with panniers on the bike, and you know when you're riding through Europe, you know it's it's very it's very common to see people like bike touring around. So so there is also that like kind of humor and, and curiosity to it, which which also people uh, you know which means people you know want to want to find out more and, and, and want to support. But uh, yeah, there's some pretty pretty special places uh, in the world that you know they're just they're just the normal places where people live normal lives. You alluded to earlier that you're. Like you don't really have a, much of a plan now, and you kind of go where it takes your fancy. So on, like on your Strava, for example, some days are like twenty five k, and in other days you're just like riding for fourteen hours. What's what's the what's the thinking behind that? Uh, it just you know I, I don't uh, I, I don't really plan too far ahead uh, at the moment, and you know th th those small days that might be a day where I need to get to like a ferry point, or I might be you know for example like when I was in. I was in KL for quite a while. A friend really kindly let, let me stay at his place. And that might be like, you know, going to see some friends or, or going to the bike shop. And you, you can't just smash out big days all the time because, you know, what, what, what I have now after this year is a whole amount of just accumulated fatigue over being on the road, being on the move all the time. And, you know, I, I have to take in and appreciate the, the times where, I, I don't have to do that every single day because it, it is like, it, it's amazing, but it is like completely exhausting, like doing this. Um, like, you know, when, when, when I see friends, you know, they'll say, oh, like, yeah, you're, you're really tired all the time. Um, like, I'll always, if, if I'm not on the bike, like I always have to sleep a lot. And so that's kind of what it is behind those days is some days I'm I'm super super motivated when when I'm on the road and you know I get into the rhythm of it. But then, yeah, as the journey's growing, there's kind of different opportunities or events or places or friends to that I've you know been put in touch with, and that's when like the small days come in when you can take it like a little bit slower. Yeah, I, I need to get back into the habit with with some races coming up of doing those doing those big days. It just it it just changes. You you can't expect yourself to just be on the bike all day because you know that. It get it gets pretty boring sometimes, you know. You have to you have to stop and take it in. And if you're tired and you keep on going, you're gonna really miss something. You mentioned races there. You've done a couple. So not only are you cycling around the world, but you're also participating in gravel races and ultra races. Is that just like you've just come across the area and you just thought, oh, there's a race on, let's do it? Yeah, the the, the first one was when I got to Malaysia. And Mal Malaysia, you know, th there's a reason I stayed there for four and a half months. Malaysia is an amazing place. Um, the, the the communities, the kindness, the the food, and the cycling community in particular is just like like not, at that point it was like nothing I'd ever seen. And yeah, like not long after I got there, some friends mentioned, "Oh, there's this gravel race, um, you know, in in the Gary Semba land. It'll be about I think it was like sixty or seventy k, called uh, Latour." And they said, "Oh, like yeah, you should you know you should do it if you fancy it." And, and and I did fancy it, you know, the riding, riding around the world on a, on a bike that weighs about 40 kilograms does like wonders for your strength. So like for, for gravel racing, it's, it's really good. Cause like you're, you're not doing loads of out, out the saddle work. It, it's seated power. Um, and that's exactly what riding this bike up some ridiculous like hills gives me. So that, that race was really fun. Uh, to, to my surprise, finished first in that. At that time, they were like, "Bro, you should do, you should do the next one," um, which was one not not too long ago now. And I said, "There's no way I'm going to still be in Malaysia at the time of that race. Like, I'll I'll, I'll have had to leave. I'll, I'll have moved on." But you know, lo and behold, I love Malaysia, so I was still there for that second race. And yeah, decided decided to go and do that, and that that also went well. And then you know the uh, re re 
guy called Raymond who works for uh, Specialized in Malaysia, he, he, he mentioned the Benteng Jawa. And yeah, like I say, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't planned to go to Indonesia before. I planned to get to Singapore, fly to Perth in Australia, and then go across Australia. But, you know, everything had gone so differently that I thought, I, you know, I'll just, I'll just completely make it up as I go along now. So, yeah, he mentioned this race and I was like, yeah, it could be, could be a really nice way to do Indonesia. You know, like, you know, I could do a huge chunk of it, you know, pretty, pretty quickly. And yeah, so I registered, registered for the Benteng Jawa. And then again, the cycling community here in Indonesia is, you know, amazing. It's a country where I think of about like 270 million, you know, so there's, there's a lot of cyclists and a lot of people who love cycling. So yeah, did the Benteng Jawa and that, that also went pretty well. And then, so then more, more have come up, you know, the, what, what I'd like to do now is kind of link together kind of different events or races kind of in line with the bike touring. So there's a race called Gravelton in the Philippines coming up, which is at the end of this month, at the, at the end of October, sorry, with just before that. And then after that, I'll be going to Taiwan to do the Taiwan Com, which is a race I'd never heard about in the UK. But in Asia, it's like one of the biggest uh, Com races. It's about 70K with about 3,000 meters of climbing up a you know, huge mountain in, uh, in the middle of Taiwan. I'm, I'm super grateful like, for the, the, the opportunities to go and do it. And I feel like for, for those two races, when like, the guys that specialize approached me and said, do you want to go and do these? You know, I was like, yeah, like, of course, that would be an amazing chance to do. You, you mentioned that you said, oh, friends recommended you do the race. But how do you go into like a country in which you've never been before and then riding it across it, for example, how do you even like make friends? Different. Uh, it was different early earlier on. Like you know the, like you know the 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 the, the scale of like say like the social media following, for example, has like skyrocketed recently. So at the beginning, it was it was kind of like purely purely by chance. You know, for example, in in Malaysia, I was put in touch uh, with uh, a friend called Jackie, and he is a mutual friend uh, in London. I don't know if you know Calvin. Um, he, he messaged Jackie, he messaged me. He said, you know, you're both, you're both going to be in the same place. Like, you know, just, just connecting dots here, you know, putting you in touch. And then, so yeah, I rode, rode with Jackie, like really, really great guy. Um, and then, yeah, we were going, we were going to KL and he mentioned that there was this, this ride in KL. It's for International Women's Day. Yeah, just by like, we, we just went, went and joined them for that. And then, and then you get introduced to like the cycling community there because like everyone was there. There were like uh, over uh, maybe like 150 people at that. Um, so it's kind of purely, purely by chance, like for, for, for that initial time. And then you just, you know, you meet people, people put you in touch with people in different places. Um, and, and you, you, like, I, I love making friends, you know, like they're like, it, it, it got, the, the first part of this journey was like so lonely. And w when I left, I thought that's what I wanted. I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't wait to be by myself for all of this time, you know, and just, you know, and, and just cycle. And, and the further it goes on, the, the more I realized that actually you do really need that social connection and, and interaction with people. So yeah, it's kind of changed from that, like just chancing with, with friends, putting me in touch to then meeting more people and then, you know, the word spreads people put you in touch with other friends put you in touch with other friends they say i know someone in this place when you get there get in touch with them so it's really uh i can't i can't i can't really give like the any credit to my to myself there it's just by chance and, and other people kind of connecting dots to you know because it, it's a way of helping the journey a lot um when they say yeah meet this person there meet this person there it, it really helps the whole process so far it hasn't been plain sailing like you had dengue fever and you also had like an affected eye and then your bike's broken loads of times tell us some uh tell us some good old-fashioned war stories about your trip yeah there's been there's been some pretty uh so there, there's been loads and loads many many more great days but there's been some there's been some days where i've just been like you know like what what is going on um yeah like you know as, as i mentioned earlier like the the, the, the rack breaking in, um, you know, in India and like, you know, finding someone to weld that together. There's been other times where it's just, you know, I've, I've knocked the mech, you know, and I've kind of bent it enough, like 
spent the hanger enough times to get it back that it's like started cracking a bit. Um, some some really yeah tough days were dengue is like the most ill I've ever been. It's at first I thought I had like some some of the one of those like you know super COVID variants. So I just I just stayed inside, and that's really what you shouldn't do if you have dengue. Like if you have dengue, you go to the hospital, you get an IV drip, you get fluids in. But I thought it was COVID, so I stayed inside. Um, actually, but before that, I did. I, I had to move to somewhere like more like cheaper to stay because I was like, this this might be a long time. Like I I have to hunker down in a in a cheap Thai motel with like the fan on blast, sweating buckets, like twelve bottles of water next to me, like isotonic drink there, everything. Um, but even when I got that, like it was it was so bad that I rode. Um, I rode about three kilometers. I left the place I was at, I rode three kilometers. And then I had to lay down at the side of the road for about an hour and a half. Cause I just couldn't well, like the, the, the breathing, the muscle ache, it was just, it was horrible. Um, thankfully, thankfully got that. There's four variants of dengue. I got one of them. So there's still three more chances to, uh, yeah, to catch, to catch the others. Um, and then, yeah, like like you mentioned, about two weeks ago now, I had an eye infection. I think I think it's gone down now. This eye is still a little bit smaller, but it started off with a scratched cornea. I, I we don't know how it happened. I think maybe a bug got into my eye when I was sleeping. Really damaged the cornea. Then the cornea was infected. The eyelid was infected, and it was like I just had to stay, you know, somewhere. Blinds closed. My eyes were super sensitive. I couldn't touch. It was like burning, it was stinging, and I couldn't I couldn't open it because I had to close this eye. This eye also wanted to close. So those have been pretty pretty horrible times. I think in, in terms of days though, like on, on the bike, one one of the worst is well there's a there's a kind of a few for different reasons. When I started riding in India, I was really not enjoying it because I, I finally realized how far away from home I was. I mean like my I've actually, uh, so my phone background is, uh, is this, it's, it's the world and it, and it shows like where you are on it. And when, it, and when I reached India, the, the world had just turned just enough on that screen that I couldn't see the UK. Anymore. And so I really hated those first few days in India. Cause I was like, you know, I would just been in, in Turkey with, with Finley filming mind mapping. We left each other and it's like, okay, this is it. I'm pretty alone now. India is such an intense country. It's busy. There's horns everywhere. It's beautiful. It's like so alive. But I was just kind of like really kind of absolutely bricking myself for what I'd got myself into. Uh, so that, those days were pretty tough. The other one, one of the most difficult ones was uh, I, I had to leave Vietnam to go to Laos. Uh, so then I could, I, I could return to Vietnam on a new visa. And Basically, the, the climb that I took up to this border crossing, it was just it was just horrible. It had been raining constantly. The road was torn up. It was just like mud sludge that just completely covered covered everything. And, you know, I'm climbing for, for you know, a couple hours uh, in like the drizzle up in the clouds. You, you think that you think, you know, Southeast Asian countries are hot all the time, but it, it, it does get like pretty cold once you get high up. So, I was, you know, also dealing with that. I get, I get to the border, you know, I have, uh, I'm, I'm told you can do visa on arrival for Laos. I already have my return visa for Vietnam. So I could just, you know, hop across, you know, stay, just stay a little, stay somewhere on the other side and then come back into Vietnam. I, I get to the border and I say, where's your, where's your visa for Laos? They say, oh, you can do it. You can do it here. Right. You know, really smiley, happy. I just got to the top of the climb. The guy's like, no, no, you can't do it here. And I, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, I got my phone up. I showed him on Google. I said, but, 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 but I read, I read here that you could, that you could do it here. He's like, no, you have to go to Lao Bao, which is like the, the next border crossing about like 400 K South. And I had like, maybe like two, two or three days left on my visa at that point. So I was like, like, God, like, you know, by the time we get to the next day, I've got to get down this horrible descent. Uh, I get, get all the way down there. And I even tried you, you know, you, 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 hear, you hear stories of, uh, all, all over the world, you hear stories of corruption. So I was even like, like, look, like, I've got my return visa for Vietnam. Like, I just, please, can you just like, you know, stamp me out, stamp me in. I don't, I don't have to enter Laos. Like, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I won't cross that line. 
I just, I just want to stay here for a bit longer. And they're like, no, 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 we can't do that. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, at, at least, at least I tried. Like, it's kind of like when, like, kind of when you, when you kind of want a train to be a bit late so you can catch it. But that's like the one time that the train is on time. Um, so, yeah, it was just, it was just a really, really horrible day. And then I had to go down, go down in the nighttime, this climb, which is, it, it's so rainy and sludgy that you can't see any of the potholes. So you're just like, you're just shitting yourself the whole time that something's going to go wrong. It's foggy. So you can't even see like 20 meters in front of you. You just, you just get the massive glare from, from the trucks on the road. And that, that was just, that was horrible. I mean, that, that, that night I did, uh, I, I treat myself to, you know, somewhere like somewhere to stay because yeah, the, you know, I, I got there. I was like, you know, just this like mud sludgy person and they just got the hose, like hose me down. And I went in and just like slept as much as I could. It was uh, it was pretty rough. I, I think that's one of the worst days. Still really amazingly fun in hindsight, you know, it's, it's all part of it, but yeah, God, it was, uh, yeah, it was hard at the time. It was just demoralizing is what it was. And then, you know, following that, I then had about like 450K and only a couple of days to get to the next the next border. And I had to do that quickly because, you know, what if that border had suddenly changed their rules as well? And then I was stuck with, you know, another, what, like 800 kilometers until the next border crossing into Cambodia with like, you know, like one day. It's pretty, it was pretty stressful because you don't want to overstay a visa. Like it's just, some countries it's a slap on the wrist and a fine, but you don't know what goes on like a record or might affect like f- f- visas for future places. So yeah, I was, I was, I was very nervous, very, very nervous. <laughs> so when you're like the other side of the world, obviously you're missing like friends and family, but is there anything else about like the UK <laughs> that you really miss? Cause we've just located to Morsine in the French Alps, which is like two hours from the UK yeah. and uh, they just don't sell tea bags here. So I'm like out in the supermarket trying to just find some Tetley tea bags. So it's like, it's all I want. It's all I want. <laughs> but you're like in India or like Asia and it's like, you mustn't have anything. Yeah, I miss, I miss good cheese is, is what I miss. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, man. I miss cheese so much. <laughs> like, like good, good cheese. Like, cheese. you know, here you go to like Indomart in Indonesia. Um, and and, and they, they, they love cheese flavored things here, but they like, they like that, like, like plastic cheese flavor and yeah you go into an indomart you see like blocks of like like cheddar cheese you know it's on the shelf it's not on a fridge it's, it's about 32 degrees so I, I don't know what that is but it's not gonna be the cheese that i miss from home so yeah i miss i miss cheese a lot uh i miss marmite sometimes as well it's like i i, I, don't, I don't really i don't think about it i don't miss it but then like sometimes i'll just be like oh man like i really i can really really do with that right now but that, that's the only things like uh, other food I, I don't really miss because you're you're absolutely spoiled for choice with amazing food around the world. You know, everyone everyone does it so so well. You know, like in in India, you get like the curries that just take huge dumps on the curries in the UK, and it just like it's just amazing, amazing. And then like you know, you come you come to Southeast Asia, and again, you're just like absolutely spoiled for choice. So it's no, it's not often that. Yeah, and also like I'll 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 try anything. I'll I'll eat anything. That, that that's partly why I cycle so much. You know, I'm I'm good at riding, but I'm better at eating. So you can just really really get stuck in. So there's there's not often that that I miss uh, that I miss like you know that that sort of food from home. I was never a big tea drinker. You can still get good coffee everywhere. In fact, like I think the Tur- the Turkish do coffee the best, and the and the Indians do do chai the the best. Um, that that's that's yet, yet to be proven wrong so speaking of food you're obviously on your big days you need to like fuel a lot and i suspect that you're not snacking on like sas gels or anything you're like just taking stuff from the late local vendor some food is more like all, all like the easily accessible food it changes like kind of how good it is for actually like kind of sustained energy when you're riding um so like you know in, in vietnam you have like pho but like it's it's a big it's a big like you know bowl of broth with noodles it's like i want like the noodles and like two or three of the amount of noodles in it and i don't really want any of the broth but you kind of just you eat it all anyway because it's delicious so yeah i never i i never really actually have food on me for like during the day 
it's I've I've like learned to be able to have like a big breakfast, stop for lunch, and, and then dinner. Uh, oft, often two dinners because it, it's really easy to kind of eat like a lot of a lot of crap, you know, like food that's you know full of sugar, not not really that good for you. And when you eat too much of that, it just you know you get a bit sick of it. It's, it's great, you know, here in, in like in Indonesia, you know, you have you have fried rice for breakfast like it's amazing you just you have a massive portion of rice you can just like cycle all day so and you know the the thing is is that really like you know it's, it's impossible to overfuel yourself on, on this sort of thing and especially you know especially when I do you know at the beginning I was just always on the road all the time all the time but now it's kind of like instant so I need to get somewhere I'll spend a big big chunk on the road and, and then I'll get to the place where I need to get to and I'll, and I'll spend some time and it, it's on those chunks where I'm on the road for a long time like I'll, I'll eat I'll eat so so much I'll eat so much but like you still uh you still see the effect that it's having on on your body you know like in in your face like in like say like, like water you lose like so much water weight um so I really just eat as much as I can if I feel hungry they like I just stop you know, and, and, and eat what's there. Like I said, all, all the food's amazing, so you're never going to really be uh, be disappointed. You're almost near and on double the length of time that you're supposed to be out. And for, like, you did a lot of it self-funded. You sort of, like, and you're eating out a lot, and obviously it's a lot cheaper out there. But are there any, like, financial difficulties where you're just like, oh, mate, this is going to be tight? Have you sort of managed to navigate all of that? Because it can't be easy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I left... Uh... I mean, you know, fortunately at the beginning, you know, uh, you know, specialized quok, uh, Albion and Hunt, you know, that they, 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 they all sponsored with, with equipment, um, and with some like financial support with that as well to, to kind of see, like to see it happen. Yeah. Like also like, yeah, a, a lot of it has been from, uh, you know, what, what, what I'd, what I'd saved up and, you know, it, it's, it's something where I, I'd, I'd rather spend that money that I've saved on doing something like this than locking myself down and tying myself to London, you know, by saving and putting something towards a, you know, a, a house deposit or, or something, which to a lot of people might seem, you know, quite, quite crazy of like, why, why wouldn't you want that security? But like, really, it's not, it's not in my heart to, to, to really like want that or, 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 or need that. But it's like, you just, you, you, you don't spend much when, when you're on the road, you know, it's just food, uh, some places to stay, like you know, I, I I camp a lot. Like depending on the place, depending on the place, it, it makes sense just to stay somewhere if it's if it's really cheap and affordable. Uh, other times you just camp when you're on the road. So, you know, you just you just keep an eye on things and make sure that you're not uh, not spending a lot. Um, so it hasn't. There, there's never a point where it's got like you know super super tight because you know you just kind of say okay, this is you know the way I the way I do it. A lot of people will probably do it. You know, a lot more uh like like specifically but normally when when i get to a new country i kind of cycle there for a week and i go okay th this is how much i spent that week this is how much like i'll spend that 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 would be like my budget or if i can push that a bit less because you know this thing happened or i, I stayed there and i won't need to stay somewhere again um so yeah, you just you just budget it and you just just take care of things and you make sure that things aren't things aren't getting low yeah and you can just you can just keep it going like I say, like my, my, my bike is my home, you know, so I, I have, I have absolutely like everything I need, um, on that to, to live a, a, apart from cooking stuff. Actually, I, I got rid of cooking stuff when I left India because I don't know why I, I'd buy rice and spend ages cooking it when I could <laughs> buy rice for, you know, like less, less than 50 P from, from like someone right next to where I'm doing it. He's going to, who's going to cook it a whole lot better than I'm cooking it. And it's going to taste a whole lot better than I'm doing it. So w when I left India, I, I, I gave my cooking stuff away. Um, and then w w when, when, when it, when it eventually gets to, you know, maybe to, uh, South, like maybe to like Australia or New Zealand, that's where I'll like pick that stuff up again. Um, and start, start cooking for myself. Cause it, cause that's another way that you just save, save so much money. But, yeah, here you can pick up like, like amazing, amazing, amazing food for really, really not much. And speaking of bikes, like you must be plowing through bike tools and chains and cassettes. How do you sort of keep on top of all that, that bike maintenance? I'm actually, I'm, I'm on, 
my I'm on my third cassette now. Uh, I didn't I didn't and I didn't change that out of necessity. Uh, apart apart from having uh, some different some different gears, it's not it's not because it wore out. Gone through quite quite a few chains. Only my second changing because I'm, I'm I'm on a different bike now um, from from the one I started on. I, I started on the twenty two the twenty twenty two Diverge, which uh, you know had I, and I, I chose the one because it had uh, you c- you can put a front mech on it. You can do two by. But then when when I was doing the Young and Dangerous gravel race in uh, Malaysia, the the guys that specialized said, "Oh, like would you would you want to do this race on the on the STR?" So that's the one with like you know they, they both have the front future shock, but the STR has has the rear future shock. So I was like, "Yeah, yeah, it'd be be really cool to to do the race on that." And that's partly because the the chain rings, the chain, the jockey wheels, uh, the cassette on the other bike were also just like mashed up. It was like. It was like it was like cycling through cornflakes. Just you, you cycle and it just it just crunches, you know, mm-hmm. underneath you. And uh, I mean, like I, I can send you a picture of, of the chainring on on that bike afterwards on the first diverge, but like just absolute absolute shark teeth. So I said, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll ride it on this uh, on the STR. And then after that, I just I, that bike is just so comfortable, and. It, it, it's one by and I was hesitant of one by, you know, that's why, that's why I left on, you know, the, the diverge comes as one by on standard, but I, I asked, um, I asked back in the UK, I asked if we could change it to, to two by the, the theory being that, you know, that the bike is so heavy as you know, like weight doesn't matter a huge amount on the flats. So on the flats, you can kind of still go like just a bit slower than normal speed. So you kind of still want normal gears, but then as soon as you hit the hill, that's where you really need like, the, the the library of gears behind you to like rely upon so that that's what i wanted to buy i didn't want the weight of the bike to like damage my knees or or any part of my body and, and being able to ride the perfect gear was like crucial for that but then i've i, I really enjoyed the, the one buy and it has it has everything i need um so we did so that's why we changed the cassette to that third cassette so now i'm on now i'm on a 1044 so when it gets to like the like 20 plus percent gradients that you get in Southeast Asia. Like my body isn't screaming at me. Like, why, why, why are you doing this? Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm yet to change any of the stuff, any of the stuff on that bike. But I, I did on the first one when I got to Cambodia, it, it was in the, the second mind mapping film, like the, the clip of it. No, no one I've shown that chain to has, has ever seen anything like it. It's like the, I, I I don't know the exact words. Like I, I'm I'm not a mechanic. Um, but it was just it was just falling apart. It was it was horrible. And then in fact the next day because I had to change that chain because it was it was about to snap. I had a new chain in the old cassette. So when I was riding from Siem Reap in Cambodia to the to the Thai border, all all you know all the gears were jumping. So I only had one gear to ride in. And if I got out the saddle, that gear would like that gear would snap and and jump as well. So going back to your question of like annoying or difficult days on the saddle that was just frustrating um because it was just yeah stuck in stuck in one gear and you you, you want to change it just for like five seconds before you're like okay no and i stick in stick in the gear that's a little bit too hard but you know the the, the thing the thing with the bike as well is that like m- most people don't tour on uh, a carbon bike or like you know what like big really really big tours on a carbon bike with electronic gears and friends even even my dad said to me beforehand he was like you know are you do, do you think you're doing the right thing by going with a carbon bike with sram etap and i said I, and i was honest like to my dad and i said yeah, look I, I know like i'm not i'm not sure but the sram it's been amazing you know it's never ne- never gone never gone wrong when the battery runs out, I have spares on me. You just jump off the bike, change it in a second, you're off again. Later that day, it takes 30 minutes to charge. Like, done. Easy. Works every single time. Uh, you know, the carbon, the, the hunt wheels, I left with carbon wheels. Again, jo- Josh Ibbett said to me, he said, you're better off on carbon than, than alloy rims. I said, I said, surely not. I said, surely alloy rims are going to be better. But, you know, I've, I've, I've dented alloy rims off of way less than what I've ridden you know, in, in the last year, like there was this one road, oh, not, not one road, qu- quite a few roads in Cambodia where it's just like, I, I kind of want to call, call them cobblestones, but that, that makes them look cute. 
you know they're, they're not they're not polished on the top they're like jagged and sharp and it's just that for like endless endless kilometers and the bike's so heavy that you know it bottoms out quite easily but carbon wheels like they just take it they i've i've smashed those wheels and like you know to the point where i've got off you know and, I, and i've you know i've gone along with my finger you know to to feel like for any cracks because i'm i'm sure that something's gone wrong they've never gone wrong i think i've broke like broken one spoke on those wheels and and they're absolutely fine um and same same with the frame as well you know I've, like there, there have been a few flights carbon frame no problem you chuck it down anywhere no problem it's such it's such a reliable material and and i i'm and i'm so like happy about that because it makes it a lot easier you know whereas on the other hand like the uh like the 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 rack that broke in in india that that was a alloy one you know and you think ah oh, but alloy would, would be stronger so I've switched. I'm, I'm on. I'm on a carbon tail fin one now, and again, like flawless. Like it's it's so strong. It can just it can just take anything. So that, that's what surprised me most with with the bike stuff is that you know I was a bit apprehensive at the start of is is carbon and electric gears the the right decision and yeah it's been like it's been it's been a pleasure uh, to, to ride it. You must be the only person on planet Earth to say anything positive about SRAM, but I'll take it. That's sorry, I, I like my like I, I I see people on like stories in the UK and they're going out for like you know 90k in the Kent lanes and they're like oh yeah, SRAM's broken it's like how how has that happened like I, I don't I don't know if that's SRAM's fault or like what you're doing to like to, to the bike because like I say like I don't I don't know how many k it's been now it's probably like close on 30,000 no problems like I I like I, before this, I was, you know, save the rim brake, you know, mechanical, you know, for, for the people, I'll stick with that. But uh, I, I, I'm pretty close to like being fully converted to, uh, to, to, to ETAP and hydraulics. So then when you're doing these big days, what, what, what are you listening to? Do you do a lot of it just like headphone less or are you, are you like an audible guy or a podcast guy? Or what are you listening to? Apart from the Pursuit podcast, of course. <laughs> yeah, I listen, I listen to a bunch of stuff. Sometimes, sometimes it's audiobooks, sometimes it's podcasts, sometimes it's music. Uh, if I climb, if it's anything uphill for more than like a few K, it's nothing. Um, I, I, can't, I can't listen to anything when I climb because like that, 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 that's where you can really take in your surroundings when you're going uphill. You don't, you don't have, you know, un, un, unless, unless you're like, you know, in the tour, you, you don't get like wind, uh, wind in your ears when you're going uphill, right? So you can really hear all the sounds around you, take everything in. Um, like appreciate the environment you're in, look around. So that, that that's when I don't listen to anything. Apart from that, I listen to a lot of music. Um, you know, Spotify has been been amazing. You know, also when I get to countries, I normally ask people for music from their countries, so that I can kind of find out like what's what's popular there. You know, what's what's the music that like their parents might listen to? What's the music that they might play at like family gatherings or, or something? And so you really kind of like discover a lot of like fun, different different things. I mean, like the, one of my favorite songs at the moment is uh, it's from like this Indian film, probably from like the seventies, and it's like big, grand orchestral um, with like amazing singing. But yeah, it's it's an amazing song. So there's been a lot that, a lot that's kind of been discovered uh, that way, even like. Uh, like Cambodian jazz music, also like incredible. Yeah, I do. I do listen to books, but but that's kind of where I want time to pass a bit more quickly. I I, I can't. Uh, I'm a, I'm a visual learner. Like I can only really take things in if I read it properly. So when when I listen to, uh, when when I listen to books, I just find out I'm always I'm just always always reminding rewinding it always. One of what one of my favorite uh, podcasts is the um, Off Menu. That's that's an amazing podcast. That, that that's the one that I'll listen to and I'll just be like bursting out laughing as I'm as I'm riding because they're just they're just hilarious together. But yeah, a lot a lot of podcasts as well. They 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 help the time go quickly. Also like Joe Rogan ones. If if he's got a good guest that I'm interested in, like normally a uh, normally a scientist for that. Uh, cuz that that's like 3 hours long. You know, at the end of the day if it's a big day, if you've got, you know, 80 to 90 kilometers left you, you stick on a joe rogan podcast when it finishes like you finish the day as well so it's really good for timing things but yeah it, it changes a lot kind of what i'm into I, i'm listening i'm listening to a book at the moment 
Well, I, I've been listening to a few like on religion uh, at the moment and all, all sides of that because, you know, it's much, you know, m much stronger over here uh, than it is like, you know, in the UK. And I'm just curious to learn from like uh, both sides. So I listen to kind of different books and all ends of the, of the spectrum on that at the moment. Yeah, whatever helps the time pass. If, if I need help, if I need the time to pass. Sometimes you go slow, you pootle, you take it in. That's great. That's all you need. And going forward, do you think the journey is going to continue in a similar format when you get to sort of Australia and New Zealand and then to America? Like quite slow, steady, take in the local scenery. Or do you think you're going to be more like head down, get it done as you sort of go back into the Western world? And, and, and you know, that, that, that's, that's kind of why I've been delaying going there. It, like if I'm honest, you you learn you learn a lot when you're in cultures that are so different from your own, and you know you realize like none of them are right or wrong or do things better or worse. They just like do things in a different way, uh, and and that's on like you know both sides. There are you know amazing things I've learned over here that help me appreciate things better, which I, I wouldn't have got like uh, in this in this. I don't think I would have gotten the same way in the UK. Um, so that's why I've kind of been pushing off going to Australia because I think, you know, what the amazing scenery, uh, amazing sunsets, amazing people, but just the, the difference in culture wouldn't be, you know, as, as great as it is, uh, you know, being in India or being, or being in Southeast Asia. The other thing is that like, you know, it's been 13 months, like I'm, I, I'm, I miss home so much, like, and, and the last two months have been really, really difficult in that. And, and every day, you know, you're, you're, or I, I ride and I, and I think of landing, you know, getting back, I, I think of getting back to the UK and like seeing my mum, you know, and like, it, I just, I'm just like cycling on and I'm just like welling up with tears because I, I, I really miss it. So I think when it gets to those countries, it will be, yeah, it, it will be, you know, get, get, get your head down, get some of this thing ticked off, you know, tick off the miles, get, get around the world. And then, yeah, like eventually, eventually get home. You know, there, there are some places that, that I'd love to be able to include in, in this journey. But re really, the, the fact of the matter is, is that I, I miss home. I, I still want to appreciate everything, but I'm going to get home. And the parts of the world that I don't do in this journey, they're, they're still going to be there, you know, at other times. You can, you can fill those in um, again. You know, like for, for example, where I said I, I flew from the center of Turkey to Mumbai, so I skipped around in Pakistan. That, that, that'll be the next trip after this one. We'll be filling in, we'll be filling in that gap. You know, eventually when you can go to Myanmar again, it will be filling in that gap from where I left India to, to Hanoi. You know, I keep on having the conflict of maybe it's the US or maybe it's South America, but really I think if I go to South America, I'm, I'm, not, gonna, I'm not gonna leave. And as much as I wanna go there, I know myself well enough now to understand that I, that I, do, I do need to get home and see family. Uh, I've I've toyed with the idea of maybe going home for like ten days or so. I, I met a I met a cyclist called D David McCourt who's cycling from Perth to Northern Ireland, and we, we met in Malaysia. We were just cycling opposite ways, ends up chatting for ages, and have, you know, occasionally uh, mess each other and keep in touch. He's on an amazing journey. His stories are like fantastic, but he 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 flew home. To, to, to Ireland to see his family and then flew back to India, you know, to carry on. And, and I asked him, like, how, how did you come to that decision? Um, or like, you know, do you feel like, how does that affect how you see your own journey? And like, he was very honest. He just said like, your journey is what you make it. You know, no one else sets the rules, but, but you. Um, so I have toyed with the idea of like potentially going home for like have an exit flight booked already. I, I leave the bike, I leave everything here. You know, got, all I need on the plane is like, you know, a phone charger and my passport. I, I leave everything here and, and maybe go back. But then at the same time, a, a part of me would kind of feel, uh, uh, I, I'd be scared that I'd get on that plane, I'd sit down and, and I'd regret that decision immediately. You know, cause, cause I, I, I left, I left home saying, I'm going to, I'm going to go and ride around the world. This is what I'm going to do. You know, so I'd, I'd feel a bit of a loss if, if I went home before I, I did what I said I was going to do. It's, it's a big conflict at the moment. So yeah, I think when, when, when I reach those countries, uh, some of the countries will just have to be yeah, like head down, get it, get across it. And uh, yeah, kind of set, set sights on home. I, I still don't, yeah, like I said, I still don't know exactly when that will be. 
probably probably sometime next year um, maybe the whole thing will end up being like a two-year thing rather than eight months like I like I naively thought but you know you have to take it in and appreciate it if I if I got home you know back in March eight months like or a few months ago when I thought I'd be home I, I would have I would have really wasted the opportunity that, that I have at the moment to, to be doing this yeah I would have only seen the world from from the road and 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 you and you can't do that you, you wouldn't learn you wouldn't take it in you wouldn't appreciate you wouldn't put yourself in you know difficult uncomfortable like situations where you don't know where you're going to sleep you don't know what you're going to eat you're quite far away from everything it, it would have been a very different journey if, if it was an eight-month journey so I, I i like how long i've been away but at the same time that the homesickness is is hitting me quite a lot do you think you'll have any difficulty adapting back into the london life having led such like a nomadic existence to pass it 30 months so there's a guy called rory stewart and he did like a six-month walk across um all of the stands uh ended up in afghanistan and he went back to london and he just said it was so difficult to adapt for two weeks he just lived like a monk and then he was just <laughs> he was like after two weeks he was just back to normal again <laughs> yeah i've I, i've i've wondered about that as well it it, it would it, it it would happen eventually, like you know, uh, uh, you you could spend you know yeah. So maybe overall this journey might might, might be might be two years. Uh, I, I still live twenty three years in London. That that that's that's still that's still within me. Um, the but you know what 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 is happening is that you learn things from other places that you know. I tell myself, I hope I can bring these back home and and you know continue these these habits. Um, and these things I learned to kind of implement them and kind of like merge them together in a way that kind of, you know, forms, forms who you are. The thoughts, you know, the, the thought of going home and paying like what, whatever, whatever Oak Flat White costs now in London, that, that I, I don't think I'll be able to do that, honestly. Um, it, that, that, that thought actually like really scares me of, of, of how expensive London is. It's something that I spoke to Finley about a couple of times where, you know, he'd, he'd been in East Africa, um, you know, for like, you know, stints and yeah, like, you know, your whole, every, everything changes and then you get home and yeah, before long you do just like revert in, in, into that way. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what that would look like for me really. Like maybe when I return to London, yeah, again, I'll already have an exit flight booked because it's 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 not it's not in my heart to 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 stay kind of in in one place um anymore like being being on the move is so comfortable difficult but it's it's comfortable now it's it's like it's it's my day to day it's normal to me which is like which is not not to like not appreciate what what it is but it's it, it like it, it's my day to day now so it'll be, it will be hard to kind of waking up in the same place every day um you know for for a pretty long amount of time the other thing that I'm kind of nervous or kind of more excited for actually is when I get back to the UK is I, I think I'll be able to see the UK in like a, a completely different way because I've been away for a long time and, you know, you, you, you start to see different things in different places that you appreciate more. And again, like often it's just the completely normal, the completely normal stuff. And when you live in a place for so long, obviously you, you stop noticing that because it, it's normal. You become just like, you know, blind to it. So I'm kind of excited to go back home and, you know, maybe be able to see home in like the way maybe like a tourist sees it um, and just be able to appreciate it like for, for what it is. Because London is an amazing place. I love it because it's my home. I hate it because it's my home. It's that sort of thing. But yeah, I hope uh, it, it's, it's my hope that the, the, the things I've learned and, and the other habits that I've picked up um, you know, from from the different cultures uh, that that I've been traveling through, you know, do do stick with you and and help you live your life like in a in a, in a better way. Do you have any idea what your life is going to look like when you head back home? Are you going to go back to the job that you had at Herne Hill, or are you going to look for something else? Because I I got a suggestion for you. I think when you go back, you should write a book about your travels. And I've got two good reasons for that. One is that the photographs that you take <laughs> are ext extraordinary and the second is that oh, like when you are descriptive in your instagram captions is like it's very lyrical and i think you, you you could be a terrific writer and i and i would definitely buy the book I, i'd i'd really really like to um like I, I was actually talking 
talk, talking to a friend. Uh, so, so when I got back to Bali, there was a, a really, back when I was in Cambodia, I met a really, really lovely uh, American lady called, called Sandy. Um, and like, you know, she, she's so cool. Her whole life, she's moved around the world, lived around the world, like traveled a lot. Um, you know, she, she's got grandkids who I'm like about the similar age to. So we, we, we spoke quite a lot. I, I met up with her and I, I was speaking about her with this today. And like, I, I do have a dream of getting back to the UK, going up to Scotland and like just, yeah, writing about, about everything. I, I really love writing because it's, it's the only way that I feel I can like articulate myself properly. I hate I hate the way I talk, um, because you know there, there, there's just so much there's so much stuff going around in your head, in my head all the time, and, and writing is the only way that you can like slow that down and like translate uh, in exactly the way that you that that, that it is, you know, on, on onto paper, and then you can like read your thoughts, and it helps organize everything and, and understand everything. So I, I would really really like to write something, but I write slowly. I, I'm really picky, um, like even, even a lot of those, like, you know, captions that, that I think you mentioned, um, I'm so picky with words because, because words carry so much meaning, uh, and, and especially, you know, the other thing is that the English language has, has like, it, it's like such a huge dictionary. There's so many words. So each one is like, you know, every single word is slightly nuanced, gives a slightly different, uh, indication and, and impression. And so I get quite caught up on like making sure that I choose like the, the, the exact, the exact words so, so that I can hope that someone else can understand the, the way something feels. I'd love to do it. I would love to, but really I've got no idea what, what things will look like when I go back, when I go back home and I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not really thinking about it too much. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to worry about the future um, or, or what that holds. I just, I, I just want to be here and appreciate what I'm doing right now because there'll, there'll come a day when, when, I, when I'm an old man uh, and I'll look back and I'll go like, I'm, I'm so happy I put all my focus uh, on, on, on doing that thing. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking about what happens when I get home at the moment, um, but, I, but I would like to write something. I would really like to. So I've really enjoyed following your journey so far and uh, I can't wait to see what happens in the future. And uh, I can't wait to place an order, a pre-order for that book. So uh, thank you. Thanks very, very much for coming on to the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No, it's, it's been, it's been great to chat. And yeah, I, I don't like in, in the same way that you are, like, I, I'm excited to see what happens. Like, you know, I, like, I, I, don't, I don't plan things too much anymore because you can't, you, you can't plan a journey of this, of, of this scale. You can't begin to, if you try and dictate it, it's just going to break free anyway. Like the, the journey is its own thing and you kind of let that guide you. So like, I, I'm also excited to to find out what happens. You know, at one point I thought I'd be back uh, in a few months and then, you know, it gets longer and then you get opportunities to go to, to other places. So I, I also have really kind of no, um, no, no fine idea of what's going to happen, only the overall picture. So yeah, I, I'm excited as well. But yeah, I, uh, I I thank you for having me to to, to chat and uh, and have me on. I'm, I'm glad we finally got around to it.